Okay, everyone, let's just jump right into it. My presentation is called Why Black and White? To understand black and white, we first must examine the history of black and white. We need to undertake a comparative and historical analysis with an emphasis on the relative intrinsic value of the inherent intermodal causeways of the medium when compared to other disciplines. If you understood that, wow, good for you, I don't. In the beginning, all black and white, all art was created in black and white. But then color was invented and the world turned colorful. And then photography was invented and the world turned back to black and white. And then coat of color was invented and the world turned colorful again. The end. That's about all you need to know about the history of black and white. How many of you would buy a three-legged dog? Or get on an airplane with only one wing? Or buy a car with no wheels? So why? Would you take a perfectly good color image and strip it of all color? Why? It would be like driving a Model T in a Tesla world. It would be like using wet plates in a digital world. It would be like owning a three-legged dog, just somehow incomplete. I'd like to tell you about my story to black and white and why you might consider it. My story begins in Rochester, New York. I was 14 years old, and I was out for a hike one day with a friend when we came across this old wretch, crumbling building, a house. My friend told me that it had once been owned by George Eastman, and that piqued my interest, Kodak Town. Kodak once ruled the waves, and it was centered in Rochester, New York. And so I checked out his biography and began reading about how he made photography accessible to the common man. Before I had finished reading that book, I had this feeling I was destined to be a photographer. And that sounds silly coming from a 14 year old boy, especially when you consider I had never yet taken a picture or been in a dark room for that magic moment when the print comes up out of the developer. But I was convinced then and I still am today, that's my destiny. And so for the next 10 years, Everything in my life was photography, literally every waking moment. If I wasn't shooting, I was working in the darkroom. And if I wasn't working in the darkroom, I was studying the works of the great masters. And as I looked at their images, I was always drawn to a very particular type of image. They were dark images. They were contrasty images. They were images that caused a shudder to go down my spine when I saw something that I loved. And they inspired me, and they made me want to create images just like those. This is what I call my first fine art image created at the age of 14. Now, a lot of people ask me, but why black and white? You were born into a color world. And I tell them, no, I wasn't. I was born into a black and white world. When I was a boy, television was all in black and white. Movies were in black and white. The news was delivered in black and white. My childhood heroes were in black and white. And even our nation was still segregated into black and white. And so I created black and white images. And perhaps these images are an extension of the world that I grew up in. For me, color records the surface of the image, but black and white reveals what's going on underneath the surface. Or put another way, color is a happy meal and black and white is fine dining. Now, what do I look for in a great black and white image? As mentioned, I love a dark image. I love a glowing subject. I love that contrast. I love detail, especially when the detail is enhanced by contrast. I love simple shapes textures, and patterns. Increasingly, my work is getting more and more simple, and I often use long exposures to simplify my images. For example, with water, with sky. 
And I'm even using long exposures with people. This image is called the Angel Gabriel, and I call it my most significant image. Why? Because it was the first time that I didn't just take a picture. I actually created something through my vision. As I stood there, I could see this image in my head, the final image. I was photographing on the Newport Beach Pier, and it was a crowded day. Hundreds of people were walking past. But because I was using a 30-second exposure, most all of the people disappeared, except for those few ghosts who lingered for just a couple of seconds. And the image was interesting, but it was lacking, lacking a subject. So as I looked around for someone to stand in my image, I saw this homeless man, and he was eating French fries out of a trash can. And I approached him, and I asked him if he would stand in my photograph, I'd be happy to buy lunch for him. And he reluctantly agreed. Well, he wanted to hold his Bible, and this is the image that we used. I found out that his name was Gabriel, hence the name, the, the Angel Gabriel. We went to a four-star restaurant there at the beginning of the pier, and imagine me bringing in this homeless man, barefooted, filthy, with matted hair. As we sat and looked at the menu, I said, Gabriel, order anything that you like. And he said, I'd love a steak with mushrooms and onions. I haven't had one in years. And when the waitress brought it, he picked it up with his hands and ate it. He was a delightful fellow. I found out that he was from Romania, and I'm half Romanian, so we talked about the old country and my family name. I also found out that he had been a drug addict, but was now clean, but he seemed impaired from that experience. As we were parting ways, I discovered that his father lived nearby. And I said, Gabriel, give me your father's name and address, and if I sell any of these images, I'd be happy to share a portion with you. To which he replied, give it to someone who can really use it. I have everything that I need. And Gabriel walked away with his only two possessions, his Bible and a bedroll. Prior to the pandemic, I would visit Southern California three, four times a year, always going back to the Newport Beach Pier looking for Gabriel, but I never did see him again. So how do you learn to photograph in black and white? Well, here's what I did. First, I put my camera into monochrome mode and raw mode. Notice the and. Why the and? Because in monochrome mode, it lets you see the image in black and white. But when you're in raw mode, the image is saved as a color image. And I want it to be a color image. I don't want the camera to convert it to black and white. I want to control that. Don't photograph in monochrome and JPEG mode because then the camera is going to make those black and white conversion decisions for you and you'll have a black and white image. Next, oh, I wanted to demonstrate. See the upper left image? That is one that I converted to black and white through Photoshop. And the bottom right is one that I took in black and white with the camera. Look at the difference when the camera makes the decisions and I make the decisions. Next, learn how colors translate into shades of gray. Because really, black and white is all about the contrast. And more importantly, learn how to manipulate those colors into different shades of gray. And later I'll show you how to do that in Photoshop. And then think in terms of shapes, contrast, and composition. Because with black and white, there's nothing to hide behind. It's a bare image. And if you don't have a great image, a great composition, it's very readily apparent. What subjects look great in black and white? I think they all do except one, unicorns. Definitely shoot unicorns in color. Everything else in black and white. Now tonight, I would like to give you a sampling of some of my work. I'd like to show you images from each of my different portfolios interspersed with some of my photographic philosophies. Now, what is a portfolio? A portfolio is simply a group of images that are related or they tell a story. And for years, I resisted working in portfolios. I called myself a photographic grazer. I just liked to go wherever the grass was greener. Well, a few years later, I decided to submit my work to Lenswork, a great black and white publication. And the submission guideline said, send us 15 to 25 images on a single subject. Do not send us your greatest hits. Well, I thought to myself, he's never seen my greatest hits. And off they went. Well, they came back very quickly with this big scrawled note that said, pick one and give me 15 images on that subject. 
And that was the kick I needed to create my very first portfolio, which was grain silos. I live on the edge of the Eastern Plains uh, and every center of every little town is a grain silo. And at the center of every family farm is a grain silo. They're everywhere. And I wanted to photograph them not as objects of utility, but rather as objects of art, because I loved their gleaming metal surfaces, especially when hit by the sun. And so for nine months, I just traveled the plains looking for grain silos. Now, I've heard that you don't consider yourself a photographer. I don't. I think of myself now as an artist who uses photography. For 35 years, though, I did have the mindset of a photographer. As a photographer, I almost worshipped my equipment. I always had the best equipment, the newest, the greatest equipment. But as an artist, my god is the image, and my camera is simply a tool. As a photographer, my goal was to show you what I was seeing through my eyes. But as an artist, I want to show you what I'm seeing in my head through my vision. That means I have to create it. There's nothing wrong with documenting. There's nothing wrong with being a photographer. But I wanted to create. Melting giants. A few years ago, I had heard about these incredible icebergs in Newfoundland. So off I went on a 9,000 mile, one month road trip. I thought it a, a rather sad story. These icebergs begin their life, their very short life, where they break off in Greenland and they go counterclockwise for about nine to 12 months until they end up along the coast of Newfoundland. There they break up into smaller pieces and they beach themselves, rock on the surf, and break up. 30,000-year ice cubes on the shore. And so, because I thought it was a sad story, I created these images in black and white and as very dark, contrasty images. This was my favorite iceberg. I thought it was just a beautiful shape. These are the conditions that I actually shot in. Very bright blue skies, sunny days. And to give you a sense of scale, this iceberg on the horizon on the right was probably four or five times the size of an aircraft carrier. But then they break up into these sizes where they run aground, rock on the surf, and end up melting on the shore. Ansel Adams. Anyone around my generation, and if they were into photography, worshipped Ansel Adams. He was our photo god. He was the one who made photography accessible to the common man. He's the one who made us aware of black and white. I loved his images so much and I tried to imitate his look. And I would even go so far as to go to Yosemite and try to figure out exactly where he stood so I could recreate his images. Nothing made me prouder than for someone to look at one of my images and say, that reminds me of Ansel Adams. And I just beam with pride. Well, a few years ago, I decided to go to review Santa Fe. That's where you go and show your work to experts in the field. You just go from table to table, hoping to be discovered. Well, I got to the very last reviewer of the day, and it was a long day. He was tired. I was tired. And he looked at my images for just a few minutes, brusquely pushed them back and said, it looks like you're trying to copy Ansel Adams. And I said proudly, I am. I love Ansel Adams. And he then uttered something that would change my life. He said, Ansel already did Ansel. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? Talk about an epiphany. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Was my life's ambition to be known as the world's greatest Ansel Adams imitator? Can you imagine being introduced tonight as Cole Thompson, the foremost imitator of Ansel Adams? Or did I have something to say for myself? And that set me on a two-year journey to find my vision. Monoliths. Every year I go to Bandon Beach on the coast of Oregon. Bandon Beach has this incredible two-mile stretch of beach where these monoliths, as I call them, or sea stacks as the locals call them, just jut straight up out of the sand. And it's such a unique beach that I go there every year, year after year after year. And every year, the weather's different. Every year, the sun is different. The light is different. 
But more importantly, every year, my vision is different. And I always come home with something new. So vision, what is it? I'd heard people use the word before. I had probably used it. I had a general idea, but I didn't really exactly know. Is it a style that you develop? Is it a look or a technique? Is it a creative talent that you're born with? Is it something that some people have and others don't? And it turns out that it's really none of those things. Vision is simply the sum total of our life experiences that allows us to see the world in a unique way. Let me illustrate it differently. Imagine you took everything that you have experienced, everything you believe, everything you've been taught, and put it into a blender. And then take that mix and cast lenses that you then see the world through. What you see through those life lenses is your vision. It's how you see the world. It's how you like things. It's how you want them to be. Vision is not learned or developed. You can't take a course on it, come out with a certificate and your vision, but rather it has to be discovered and followed. And the reason I say discovered is because the most important thing I learned about vision is that we all have one. In fact, you can't not have a vision. It's just how you see the world when you set aside all your vision blockers. And I'll talk about those vision blockers in a minute. Why is vision so important? Because it's the difference between an average image and a great image. It's, it's what gives your image your mark. It's what puts a spark of life to it. It's the difference between taking a picture and creating something. Trees from a train. In the 70s, I lived in Alaska. And to my great disappointment, I just never got around to returning and visiting again. And that always saddened me. Well, last October, uh, excuse me, of 19 before pandemic, a friend calls me up and says, I've got one of those two for one ticket deals. I'm going to Alaska. Would you like to join me? And I jumped at the chance. The one thing I really wanted to do on the trip was to take the train ride from Fairbanks to Anchorage. It's a 12 hour ride through the most rugged parts of Alaska, uninhabited, wild, no roads, very few people. And we were fortunate on that day to have a great snowstorm. Well, the first thing I did, I probably everyone would do is get a window seat and then get your camera out. What can I shoot? I quickly realized it's going to be tough. Things are whizzing by very quickly. Trees have been cut out for the railway, and so they're blocking most everything. And if you do see a distant scene, it's quickly gone. Well, next thing I tried is I went between two cars and I opened both doors and I began shooting out each side of the train. The most obvious thing to shoot was the trees because there's so many of them, they keep whizzing by. So I first started panning. Then I thought to myself, what would happen if I were to use a long exposure and pan? And I tried it and wow, I couldn't believe what I was getting. I was getting these incredible swirling effects that I just didn't understand. And so for the next 12 hours, I just had fun trying to control those swirls and look, learning how to manipulate them. At the time, I had no idea what was causing them. But later I realized it was because the trees were moving one way, the train's going another way, I'm panning the other way, and the shutter, a focal plane shutter, is going from top to bottom. All those movements combined, particularly the shutter, caused the swirling. This is one of my favorites. That's the one I had as a screensaver. And then this image was most, uh, I guess, two issues ago on the cover of Lens Work. So how did I find my vision? I didn't even understand what vision was, so how could I find it? So the, the most obvious thing, Google it. Well, I couldn't find anything about how to find your vision. So I just really came up with 10 things that I thought would help me find out if I had a vision. I just had faith if I stuck with these 10 items, I would learn something. First thing I did, I printed out my favorites and I divided them into two piles, images that I really, really loved and everything else. Now that doesn't sound like a hard assignment, but let me tell you, it was for me because I have often been swayed by other people's opinions. There might be an image I didn't particularly like, but a lot of other people did. I found myself starting to like it more. 
So I had to ask myself, what did I really, really love? The next thing I did is I committed never again to produce work that I didn't love. If I was on Bandon Beach seeing an incredible sunset, and I hate sunsets, but I knew that it would sell or get wins and likes, I wouldn't pursue it. I had to remain true to what I loved. I practiced photographic celibacy, a very controversial practice. I don't look at the work of other photographers. Why? Because I was trying to find my vision. And I was always immersing myself in the vision of others. And when I saw a tree, I didn't want to see how Edward Weston saw that tree or Wynne Bullock. I wanted to see how I would see it. So I tried to stay away from other people's images to not be influenced by their vision. I changed my mindset from photographer to artist. I had been a photographer for so long that I had these little rules, photographer rules. One was you never manipulate an image. It was a silly one because we everything we do manipulates an image. But if I was going to become an artist, I had to believe that I could be creative and I could manipulate my images to bring them in compliance with my vision. And the hardest one, perhaps, was I had to stop caring what other people thought of my work. I was too concerned if people liked my work, if it would be liked, if it would win. It took me two long, 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 hard years. And at times I wanted to give up because I was so discouraged. I didn't feel like I was making any progress. But finally, it just a light bulb came on inside that said, vision is simply how you see the world, how you like the world, how you love things. Now, to illustrate what vision looks like, because it's so hard to do with words, I'd like to show you some before and after images to show you as I stood there what my eyes saw. But then to show you the final image, to give you an idea of what the vision of it was. Let's start with the angel Gabriel because that was the first time I'd ever done it. So as I stood there looking at Gabriel on that pier, I knew what the final image would look like. What I wanted it to look like. Here's the before and after, and you can see how to do some work to it. It never bothers me that I don't know how to do it. I'll figure it out. But having that roadmap, that vision, that picture, helped me with the shot and it helped me with the processing. This is called skeleton taken in our my hometown here at Fort Collins. These bones were just laying there, these dark leaves and the white bones. The problem was to the eye, it was these bright leaves and these bright bones. But that's now how I saw it in my head. Technically, I didn't yet know how to do it, but I figured it out. And this is windmill and moonlight taken above Grand Island, Nebraska. The challenge of this image was that it was a almost full moon and it was just fresh fallen snow. So it was very bright out and it was very hard to get an exposure that it would deal with this total range of brightness. So I simply took one exposure for the night sky and one exposure for the foreground and cut and pasted the two halves together. Now, some people will say to me, after seeing your before and after images, I realize I need to learn a lot more about Photoshop. And that is exactly not my point. Some people believe you got to have the technical skills before you can express your vision. I cannot tell you how much I disagree with that philosophy. I say vision comes first, then obtain the skills. Skills are easy to obtain. The vision is the hard part. When I created the series, The Ghosts of Auschwitz-Birkenau, I didn't know how I would create those ghosts, but I had that idea in my head. And as you can see from this image, man, I was, I had to do a lot of work to take that before image and make it the after image. But again, the technical is not the hard part. I knew what that final image would be. This is from those melting giants, my favorite iceberg. What was so sad as I took the shot was that this iceberg, the beautifulest one of all, was rocking so badly I couldn't do a long exposure on him. And so I just took a still shot and I said I'd figure it out. And when I got home, I figured a way through Photoshop to turn it into a long exposure. And this is a recent image from the hills of Idaho. And as I stood there looking at that color, in, uh, color scene, I realized that a lot of people might have left it as is as a color image. But my vision said black and white with extreme contrast. 
Now my post-processing is incredibly simple. I typically only use six tools in Photoshop. I'd like to just run through them very quickly and kind of demonstrate how I process an image. And I, I'm not suggesting people should use my six-step method, but I do like to illustrate you don't need to have this complicated post-processing routine to get a great image. The first thing I do is bring my color image, and remember why it's in color, because I shot in RAW, into Photoshop. And I just use the RAW converter, and I just play with these sliders until the image looks as close to my vision as possible. Really, literally, just play with them. Next, the biggest next step is to convert it to black and white. And this is where a lot of the magic happens. Using these color sliders, you can greatly change the contrast and tones of the image. And let me just demonstrate. These four images are all the same image, and the only thing I did differently to them is change two of the color sliders. Look at the tremendous difference between all four images. It's an incredible tool, and that's why I never want the camera or Photoshop to make black and white decisions for me. Next, and this is critical for black and white, adjust my levels. What do levels mean? It just means, do I have a true black and a true white? If you just look at the image on your monitor, you might say, this one has lots of blacks and some good whites. But if we look at the histogram, it reveals there really are no true blacks or true whites. That's why you can never trust your monitor. You have to go to your histogram. And by dragging these little sliders over, I can instantly have a true black and a true white. And that's very important for black and white. Next, I dodge and burn. And anybody who worked in a dark room knows what I'm talking about. It's the ability, by using a tablet, to very to work in very small areas on the image. For example, I used burning down to darken and vignette the sky. And I actually increased detail on the highlights by using a burning tool. And I also burned down, oh, I'm sorry, I went backwards. I also burnt down this distracting detail that was in the sand. Next, I add contrast. The reason I add contrast is a print will never look as good as a backlit monitor image. Almost every image looks really good on a monitor. But when you print it out, it looks flat and people are disappointed. Well, by adding extra contrast, you can compensate for that effect. And lastly, step six, I simply spot my image because I've always got a dirty sensor. And there's your before and after. Six very simple steps. I don't use layers. I don't use curves. I, there's so many things I don't do. I just use six simple steps. Popular photography called me the Photoshop heretic because they say I break every rule in the book, meaning I don't follow any rule. And I used to be so embarrassed that my processing was so simple. I would never let anybody else see me process an image because I know they would say, oh, you're not supposed to do it that way. And then I realized that it really doesn't matter how you get there. It only matters how the image turns out. And there really is no right or wrong way to use Photoshop. Now I'd like to share the real secret to post-processing. Knowing what you want to do, not knowing how to do it. Having that vision to guide you through the processing. That's the real key. Anyone can learn the how to do it. Whenever I stand there looking at the scene, I always know what the final image will look like before I take the shot. That's my vision. Isolated. This is a very simple portfolio about isolation expressed through trees. And this is what one of my open portfolios, meaning simply, it's not finished yet. And I have a number of these open portfolios and I like that because when I'm traveling throughout the world, I can always find something to fit into one of these portfolios. And these trees are from all over the world. This is the Hopewell Rock in New Brunswick up in Canada. And when I was up there shooting the icebergs, I came here because it's famous because it has the highest tides in the world, over 55 feet. 
And then when I got there, unfortunately, the tide was out and you could walk far out into the bay, farther than this image. So I had to wait over 12 hours for the high tide to occur after midnight. And when I did, it was I was positioned down there at the very bottom step to get down to the, the base of the, the bay. And the water was actually coming ab above the legs of the tripod. And it was so dark that I had to use an eight minute exposure using a flashlight to bring some detail into those side hills. But I got it. So talking about locations, when you go to a new location, how do I prepare? I don't. When I go somewhere, I only do two things. I book a flight and I rent a car. I don't book a hotel. I never look at photographers work of the area and I never look at one of those travel guides so you can find the must see sites. Why don't I want to see the must see sites? Because I don't want to be like everybody else shooting the same scene because it's a famous site. Those scenes have been shot a billion times by a million other people. And that's how I approached my trip to Iceland. I simply booked a flight, rented a car and drove for four weeks. Did I miss the iconic sites? I sure hope so, and I'm grateful that I did. But I also hope that I created some of my own iconic sites, images that other people hadn't seen before. Now, ironically, after I got home and showed this series to people, I found out this was one of the iconic sites that I stumbled onto, but I didn't know it at the time. It was a great trip. Uh, one thing I really did want to do when I was there, though, was go to this bay where the icebergs go out to sea. But when I got there, they were having the storm of the century. And we hit winds of 137 miles per hour. And as I drove along, I passed over an alluvial gravel field where the gravel was just thrashing my car. And all the windows exploded out, stripped the paint. Um, I was driving at five and 10 miles per hour trying to follow the stripe in the road when the, the stripe would disappear and I didn't even know if I was on the road. It wasn't until I got home, a friend sent me this from the Reykjavik newspaper showing that parts of the road had literally blown away and that's why I was missing the stripe. But it was a fun experience. Do you dance? I heard this story told by a physician on the radio this physician was working in the emergency room on a Navajo Indian reservation. It was Saturday and an old man came in with long gray braided hair and he just stood there staring into the distance, not saying a word. Well, the physician grabbed his clipboard and went up to the old man and said, can I help you? And the old man just kept staring and didn't say anything. And the physician just a little perturbed said, look, I can't help you if you won't talk to me. And the old man turned to him and looked him in the eye and said, do you dance? And this caught the physician off guard and he pondered that for a moment. And he wondered if this wasn't perchance a medicine man who believed in healing through song and dance. And so he answered, I don't, can you teach me? And the old man said, I can teach you to dance, but you must hear the music. And I thought about this story for two reasons. First, a few years ago, my wife decided to spice up our marriage that we were going to start going out dancing. And so she signed us up for dance lessons. And how my wife and I learned to dance was so different. I learned by memorizing the dance steps, staring off into the distance and repeating out loud, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. My wife closed her eyes. She listened to the music and swayed with it. Here I am stiffly counting and here she is swaying. I remember the first time we went out dancing for real and she whispered into my ear, are you going to count out loud all night? And it also reminds me of us as photographers and how we learn photography. We learn the photography, the technology of photography with our minds and we love it. Depth of field and apertures and shutter speeds and all these things that we just love to get into but we've got to hear the music. We've got to have our vision. Otherwise, like my dancing, it's gonna be a little stiff. Harbinger. My son number four, Jem, was 
13 years old, he and I embarked on a father and son road trip one summer. And we were out in Eastern Utah on I-70. As we drove along, I saw these incredible mud hills off to the north. And I said, we're stopping. And my son starts to groan. If you guys photograph with family non-photographer family members, you know what a chore it is to take them along. And he starts complaining. How long are you going to be? Can I stay in the car and watch a movie? No, it's too hot. You need to come with me. So as we go up these hills to photograph, he is complaining the entire time. How much longer? You said minutes, 10 minutes ago. Can we go now? The scene I was shooting was interesting, but kind of like the Angel Gabriel situation, interesting but lacking a subject. And I was tired of his complaining, and I said, fine, we're going back. Well, we get back to the truck, and I glance back over my shoulder at those mud hills I had been photographing. When I noticed there was this single white cloud moving across the top of the hills, and that in a minute or two, it would be right over the mud hills I had been photographing. So I yelled, we're going back. And we ran back up that hill, got the tripod out, got the camera set up, and I got off one shot. And I always name my images the first thing that comes to mind. And I named it Harbinger, an omen of things to come. I loved this image. Others did too. And they would ask me, are you going to do a series on it? And I'd just chuckle. What are the chances of finding single clouds in interesting scenarios? But you know, when you become aware of something, you start to see them not everywhere, but frequently. And as another open portfolio, as I've traveled the world, I have found a complete portfolio of these harbingers. Now, this harbinger taught me a lesson. I lay in that field for several hours waiting for that cloud to center itself over that windmill, but it never did. And it was there I learned that there are two types of clouds, the kinds like the very first one that move across the sky and clouds like this one that form and dissipate, form and dissipate all in the same spot. I don't know why, but I'm glad it never centered itself. I like it better this way. So how important is equipment when creating an image? Not nearly as important as we think, and certainly not nearly as important as your vision. A story. A famous photographer was invited to dinner by a wealthy New York socialite. She greeted him warmly at the door and said, I love your work. You must have a fabulous camera. He said nothing. At the end of the meal, he thanked her profusely and said, that was delicious. You must have a fabulous stove. I hope we're all smiling at that because we all know a great stove does not make a great meal. It's the cook, the chef. Yet how many times do we as photographers act as though our equipment is the key to a great image? If I had to choose between the world's greatest equipment, but no vision, or that simple Kodak brownie with my vision, I'll take the brownie because I am completely confident I can create great images with that little camera. When I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, I spent all afternoon at the Winter Palace photographing this row of trees. But when I got home, I was so disappointed because none of them were to my liking. I don't know how I blew it so badly. And then I remembered that I had taken a single snapshot with my eight megapixel iPhone. And I opened that image up, cropped it and worked it. And it became this image, a simple eight megapixel, small sensor iPhone. Ukrainians with eyes shut. My son number two was serving in the Peace Corps in Ukraine. And so my wife and I went off to visit him. And as is my practice, I made no preparations. I didn't want to go there with any pre preconceived ideas. I just hoped that I would see something that would inspire me and I would come home with a great project. Well, I'm about three days into the project and I haven't seen anything yet. And I'm starting to get nervous about the days raining. The people were interesting. They always are in a foreign land, but the problem is they always put on a camera face, that big smile when you take their picture. 
and I didn't have a language to get to know them or time to break down barriers. So as I was pondering that problem, we were standing at a bus stop and I saw this old man leaning against the wall and I approached him and I tapped on my chest and said, America, he nodded. I held up my camera, I said, photographer, he nodded. I then used the universal symbol for, can I take your picture? He nodded. I took his picture. Then I said, using sign language, stop, close your eyes. And he scrunched his face up saying, what? And I said it again, close your eyes. And I took his picture and it got rid of the camera face. And I started playing with this. And for the next week, walking around the streets of Ukraine, I stopped people in the street and using sign language, asked them if I could take their picture with their eyes shut. And I had a blast doing it. And I made a lot of friends, two friends that I still communicate with to this day, some 15 years later. This guy, I published this work and people all over Europe have sent me pictures of him. I guess he's everywhere. Then I was in the city of Lviv and this little old man shuffles up to me. He's five foot nothing. And he says in very broken Italian English, what are you doing? And we explained. And he said nothing and shuffled away. Well, a few minutes later, he came shuffling back with a camera in his hand. And he said, can I take your picture? And I said, sure. And he said, with your eyes closed. And so he took a picture of me and sent it to me. And at that moment, I became very appreciative of how trusting people have to be to shut their eyes on the street for a stranger. The thoughts that go through your head are, is this a trick? Is it a joke? Are, are my possessions safe? So I was so grateful at how trusting the Ukrainian people were. Cole's rule of thirds. I was exhibiting in Boulder, Colorado. It was opening night and a woman came up and stood next to me and she looked at one of my images and said, you know, that image doesn't follow the rule of thirds. And this one, you should never put the horizon on the center line. And I looked at her just astounded, astounded that she couldn't see my images. She could only see rules not followed. And so I created Cole's rule of thirds, sort of in jest, which states a great image consists of one third vision, one third the shot, and one third processing. But it is the vision that is driving the shot and driving the processing. For so long, I was out of balance. I focused on the technical and not on the vision or the creative side. And what I created was technically perfect, but soulless snapshots. Helen Keller said, it's a terrible thing to see and have no vision. The Lone Man. I was photographing in Southern California in San Diego at La Jolla Cove at the children's pool. And I loved the way that stone jetty contrasted against the water. And I was going to do a long exposure. The problem was there were so many people out on that stone jetty, I couldn't get 30 seconds to do the long exposure. So I was frustrated, I just decided to go ahead and get the exposure all ready so that when the people left, I would be all set. Well, I did my 30 second exposure and to my surprise, almost all the people disappeared because they were moving, except for this one fellow who stood perfectly still for the entire 30 seconds. Then I began to recognize that body posture, that stance, that attitude. And it's, it's when I realized that when people stand on the edge of the world, the edge of the earth, looking out into the great expanse, they become very still and very pensive, thinking about things greater than self. Why am I here? Where am I going? Do I matter? Do I make a difference? Is there any more than this? And I call that moment when they are alone with their thoughts, the lone man. And people ask me, well, how do you get them to stand still for 30 seconds? They don't even know I'm photographing them. They just stand still. And this is one of my favorites because that little teeny lone man up there is actually my daughter-in-law. But I was so nervous because she was there with my son and their baby. And 
I got to tell you that drop, let me go back. That drop, I swear, is three to five miles high <laughs> and it, there are no guardrails. And every year, several tourists, this is in the Faroe Islands, do fall to their death. So a lot of my friends like to engage in these esoteric discussions over things such as what is art and what is fine art? And I thought that I would weigh in with my thoughts. Who cares? I only ask myself two questions. Do I like it? And would it look good on my wall? That's all I care about, not what it's called. A few years ago, I had a high school senior call me up and say, would you do my senior portrait? And I'm about to tell her, sorry, I don't do that type of photography. When she said something that caught my interest. She said, I'd like to do something that no one else has ever done to be a completely unusual senior portrait. And so we created this. We called it Ingrid Surrounded. And I happened to show it to a friend of mine who's got an MFA. And he said to me, well, you know, Cole, that really isn't a fine art image. And I said, well, Russ, I never said that it was, but please tell me why. I thought maybe there was a cow rule or something. And he said, uh, because everyone knows that the uh, subject in a fine art image never smiles. And I thought, how pompous, how silly. I say, create what you love, no matter what it's called or what other people think of it. Sometimes other people may not understand or like my work, and that's okay. It's not for them. At least it shouldn't be. Moy Standing. When I was 17, I read the book Aku Aku by Thor Heyerdahl. He was this great explorer. He had a number of books, but this is the one I love the most, his trip to Easter Island and the secret of Easter Island. How did they move these giant stone statues across the island? Well, my wife and I, a few years ago, were creating our bucket list. And I just happened to say out loud, I'd love to go to Easter Island, but of course that's impossible. And my wife said, why? And off we went the following year. While there, I created three portfolios, and this is one of those three. There are over a thousand moi on Easter Island that only 30 still stand. All of the moi face inland, except for at one ahu. The ahus are these altars that they stand on and they are sacred, you don't get near them. And so this portfolio is a rather small portfolio about these 30 standing moi and their ahus. To give you a sense of scale, this guy is the largest ahu standing, uh, uh, standing moi on Easter Island. He's over 35 foot tall. And when he had his top knot on, they all used to have top knots, he was much taller. And to give you a sense of scale, here's a horse down at his feet. They're giants. And Thor Heyerdahl thought the mystery of Easter Island was how did they transport them some 15 miles across the island? But I actually think the real mystery of Easter Island is why did they seemingly in a day drop their tools and walk away? There are hundreds of uncompleted moi at the quarry and no one knows why they just walked away. One thing I do when I go traveling is get to know the dogs. I'm a dog lover and I judge the people by the animals. For example, when you go to Moscow, do not pet a stray dog because you will be bit and you will be getting rabies shots. Ask my number two son. But at Easter Island, all the dogs are strays and they are the most gentle, docile, kind, loving animals. And I don't know why. I think it's reflective of the people. They hang around the Ahus where they beg for food. And we fell in love with this old guy. We named him Graybeard. And he was a mangy old thing, but he was just so loving. And so every day we would come by twice a day to feed and water him. So how do I pick a subject? I don't, it picks me. For years, I kept a list in my breast pocket. Anytime I had a new idea, on the list it would go. Until I realized that I had never once created a project from that list. Every project that came about was just this sudden burst of inspiration that got me excited and passionate. And I'd like to tell you one called ceiling lamps. My mother was living in Akron, Ohio, and I was back visiting her, checking out of the hotel, when I happened to just look up in the lobby and saw this ceiling lamp. 
And for whatever reason, at that moment, on that day, that lamp just fascinated me. So I pushed the table out of the lobby area and I lay down on the floor staring at that lamp. Then I got my camera out and started photographing it. Then I started doing that everywhere that I went. These lamps are almost unrecognizable when shot straight from below. They're very abstract. I doubt anyone would even know they were ceiling lamps if I didn't tell them. This is from my favorite Mexican restaurant. And that one in the upper right corner, that's at a Del Taco in Costa Mesa. I shot that after I photographed the Angel Gabriel. And I had fun with this project, arranging them, grouping them. And it was just a fun project. And then when I was in Moscow, I finally, I was thought I was finished, but I saw these three great Soviet era ceiling lamps in their subway system and added them to the collection. So why do I create? Someone asked me that once and I pondered that. And I remembered why I created as a 14 year old boy, just the pure joy of creating something to please myself, creating something that I loved. But then I started using it to get positive feedback and pats on the back. Then I started trying to win contests because in my mind, unless it won a contest, it wasn't good. Then I said I had to build a resume. Who would take me seriously as a photographer if I didn't have an extensive resume? Then I wanted to become famous. I went through that Ansel Adams phase. And then I went through the money phase to make money. And then some 50 years later, I have come full circle to once again create for the same reason I did as that 14 year old boy, just to please myself. Sometimes I'm sad that it took me 50 years to learn that lesson. But ultimately, I'm just grateful that I did learn it. I do my best work when I create for myself, and I pay no attention to what others will think. Linda Ronstadt said, I mean, it's nice to be acknowledged. It's nice for your work to be acknowledged, but it's not what you do it for. You do it for the work. And if you're doing it for the prizes, you're in big trouble. The Fountainhead. Another book I read when I was 17 was The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. It's this great story about an architect who refuses to conform. He has a vision of what he wants to design in a building and no amount of punishment or persuasion can change his mind. He's just adamant. And I loved that message. Well, a few years ago, I was in downtown San Diego, stop and go traffic. When I noticed a car in front of me with a tinted window and in the window window, I could see the reflection of the skyscraper behind me and it was all distorted, wonderfully distorted. And I loved the look and I went home and told my wife about that. And we pondered how I might recreate that look. I couldn't go chasing tinted cars around town. And so my wife actually came up with the idea of a fun house mirror, a flexible metal mirror that I could bend and distort. And so I traveled around the West and Midwest, going downtown and warping this metal plate and photographing it, the building's reflections in the plate. I just had, a, again, a fun time doing it. And it, I got wonderful distortions and learned how to bend it all these different ways. Because the mirror wanted to put me in the image, I had to lay on the ground and get be below the mirror. Otherwise, I was included. And this is my favorite from uh, Portland, Oregon. So what photographic rules should you follow? None, unless you want to create average images that look just like everyone else's who are following the same rules. Remember paint by number? We were told as children that if we would follow the rules, and they were simple, use the right color, use the right number, stay within the lines, that we would create a masterpiece. Well, maybe not a masterpiece, but a competent imitation of a masterpiece. You don't create a masterpiece by following the numbers or by following the rules. At best, all you'll produce is a crude imitation of a masterpiece. Ansel Adams said, the so-called rules of composition are, in my opinion, invalid, irrelevant, immaterial. 
and an ex Ansel Adams imitator said, there are no need for rules when you have found your vision. The Dunes of Nude. Every year I go to Death Valley in January. Why January, you ask? Because the temps are low between 65 and 70 degrees and the crowds are even lower. And every year I spend most of my time on the dunes. I go out three to four hours in the morning when sun comes up and the last two hours of the day when the sun is going down because at those times the sun is low and the shadows are long and the contrasts are extreme. And every year, like Bandon Beach, I come home with something a little different because my vision is a little bit different. There's nothing more enjoyable for me to lay on the warm sand in the middle of the day on the dunes all by myself. Now, I'd like to share the real key to a great image. It is not the camera. It is not how big your lens is. It is not your settings or your location. It's not the software that you use. It is certainly not the rules that you follow. It's not how long you've been photographing and it's not your title. The real key is your vision. That is what makes the difference between an average image and a great image. Vision first creates it, the image in my, my head, but then my skills execute that vision and it takes that picture that my eye saw and translates it into that vision. Sugimoto said, if I have a vision, my work is almost done. The rest is just a technical problem. Lenny, a portrait of breast cancer. Lenny was a customer of mine. She purchased a copy of the Angel Gabriel. And about a year later, she calls me up and says, I've got cancer. I've had a mastectomy. I'd like you to photograph me. And I said, Lenny, I am so sorry to hear that, but I really don't do that type of photography. She goes, I want you to do it. I go, Lenny, let me give you the name of this woman I know. She specializes in this type of work. No, I want you to do it. Lenny, I don't have the right equipment. I don't know anything about lighting or portraiture. She goes, it'll be okay. I want you to do it. Lenny was insistent that these images be taken because they would be useful to other women. It was a difficult shoot, an uncomfortable shoot for me, and I can't imagine how uncomfortable for Lenny. But she was insistent. Lenny was dignified and beautiful. Throughout the shoot, I had this one burning question that I wanted to ask Lenny, but I feared doing so, feared that it would ruin the mood of the shoot. But finally, as we were finishing and I was just about to put my gear away, I asked my question, Lenny, what's your prognosis? I'll be dead by Christmas. That was over 15 years ago and Lenny is still with us today. She got into an experimental program and survived and is thriving. And now Lenny is bugging me to come back to photograph her again, this time with a full head of hair, and I doubt she'll let me off the hook. And I'm glad she didn't let me off the hook the first time. I don't know if you guys experience this, but people are always telling me what I should do with my images. Sometimes they're polite about it. If this were I, my image, here's what I would do. And sometimes they're rather blunt about it. This is what you need to do to that image. I say, don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. When I created the Angel Gabriel, I was so excited. And I took it and showed it to my mentor. The first thing out of her mouth was, don't center the subject. I'm always telling you that, Cole. Don't center the subject. Well, now I'm in a quandary. I've got this one vision in my head of how it should be, and I've got my expert mentor telling me what I should be doing. So I went home and I tried cropping the image differently and I hated it. I hate it now looking at it. This is how I saw it in my head. It was my image. This is how it should be. She might've done it differently, but it's not her image. 
There are no experts when it comes to your vision. Another story. A photographer was exhibiting his work for the very first time. In attendance was a well-known art critic. The art critic approached the photographer and said, would you like to hear my opinion about your work? Sure, said the photographer, let's hear it. It's worthless, said the art critic. I know, said the photographer, but let's hear it anyway. You are the only expert when it comes to your vision. And don't ask other people what you should do with your images. People all the time say, Cole, what should I do with this image? And I tell them, look, if I told you what I would do and you followed my advice and you kept following it, soon your images would start to look like mine. And believe me, you don't want that. Confucius say, they who walk in another's footsteps never finds their own path. Moy, sitting for portrait. The second portfolio I created in Easter Island is this one. Getting to Easter Island is tough. It is called the most isolated inhabited place on earth. I had to fly to Toronto, then down to Santiago, and then out to Easter Island. And that one long leg was a killer. And on that leg, I slept and I dreamt. And you know what? I hardly ever remember my dreams. I dreamt that the Moy were actually living creatures. And I had brought along these two stands and a giant roll of paper and set up an outdoor portrait studio. Then I went from Moy to Moy, inviting them to come and sit for the portrait. But I didn't anticipate this. They had been so poorly treated by outsiders in the past, they were very reluctant to trust me or anyone. Some argued they were too old. Others said they were too infirm. Some said they didn't want to run into other family members whom they had a dispute with. And after issuing the invitations, I wasn't sure anyone would come. Well, the day came, the time came, and no one showed up. Well, later, a few of the younger Moy started to show up, and I started to take their portraits. And as word got out, more and more of the Moy came and sat for a portrait. Well, I woke up from that dream, told my wife about it, and then thought about it a bit and said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to invite the Moy to come and sit for a portrait. I did, and they came. And it was a wonderful experience. Family members were reunited. Now, the truth is, the Moy didn't come to me. I went to them. I would photograph the Moy out in the open when a cloud would come over, so it was under shadow. And then I would cut out the Moy and pl place it onto a digital backdrop I had created to look like they were sitting in front of a backdrop. Using dodging and burning, I tried to recreate the look of lighting in a portrait scenario. And I think the project turned out well. I was very, very proud of it. It appeared in lens work. It's interesting, when you first look at the Moy, they all look alike. But as you get to know them, you can tell that each one has special characteristics. And you have to wonder if they were meant to look like the artist or perhaps one of their leaders. Just let go. I talked about earlier vision blockers, things that stopped me from finding my vision. It was there all along, but it was blocked. I had to let go. That was the biggest key of finding my vision. Letting go of what others thought. Letting go of conforming to what everyone else is doing. Letting go of following the rules. Of worrying if others would like my work. Letting go of trying to win contests or earning likes. Letting go of photographing the right way, if there were such a thing. Letting go of trying to please other people, trying to produce what a judge might like. Letting go of other people's expectations. And the hardest one, letting go of the fear of criticism. Really, just letting go of everything. And once I did that, I was free, free to create whatever I wanted, however I wanted. I didn't care what anyone else thought. Vision is what's left over when you remove all of your fears and insecurities, when you stop complying and conforming, when you ignore what others are doing and you pursue what you love. There is great power in not giving a damn.
the Faroe Islands. I was watching the BBC show Shetland. And all the time the actors are on screen, I'm looking past them at this incredible coastline. And I just said to myself, I'm going to the Shetland Islands, but I had no clue where it was at. So I hop on Google Maps and I get distracted. Look at out there, the Faroe Islands, they look even more interesting. Out in the middle of nowhere, 17 little islands. So off I went for a month. The Faroe Islands are incredible. I've been there twice. It was supposed to be a third time this year, but maybe next year. They are isolated. They are rugged. They are sparsely populated. They're as green as can be if you're a color photographer, but of course, I saw them in black and white. And the, I'll tell you one amazing thing. One moment, you're looking at this old stone house with a sod roof, and you feel like you're in the 1700s. Then you go to another island by taking an undersea tunnel, a well-lit two-lane highway under the sea. What a dichotomy. Just had a blast there. Every time I came out of one of the tunnels, I saw this scene and I loved it. I stopped probably 50 times in that month to photograph this one scene. And this is the one I loved the most. So how long do projects take? They take as long as they take. I've talked about ones I've been doing for 15 years. I talked about trees from a train in Alaska where I took 12 hours. Now I'd like to tell you about one that it took less than two hours. The Ghosts of Auschwitz-Birkenau. My son, when he was in Ukraine, we decided we would go next door to Poland. Took a train over there. And we stayed at Krakow in the city center. And we were going to be there for a day, and so the family were discussing what we should do with our time. And I knew the death camps were nearby, but I did not want to go. I don't like sad stories. I don't go to sad movies. I sure didn't want to go to a death camp. But the family outvoted me, and off we went. We took a tour bus from Krakow to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I had my gear with me, but I had decided that I would not photograph there. I just thought that it was perhaps a sacred place and it would be sacrilegious or at least impolite. And so as we were getting off the bus, I asked the tour guide if I could leave my gear on board, to which he responds, no, I'm not going to be responsible for it. So we begin the tour with my gear in hand. The first thing you do on the tour is you look at this incredible book because it's got this beautiful black and white photograph of each person they imprisoned. You can tell the photographer had great skill. They were gorgeous. And then on the right, they documented the person, their name, their family history, their possessions, their occupation. And at this point, your head begins to spin a little bit. Why are they carefully documenting someone they're either going to work to death or murder? Then they take you into the room with the iconic piles, the pile of glasses the pile of human hair used to stuff pillows and mattresses, and the worst of all, the pile of human bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. Now, I'm not claustrophobic, but at this, at this moment, I just couldn't breathe, and I signaled to my family that I was going to go outside and they should continue the tour. Once outside, I just began walking slowly, looking at my feet. And I started to breathe easier, but then the feet, the feet, the feet. Where I stepped, who else had stepped here on their way to the gallows? Who else had walked this same path on the way to the gas chamber? And I began to wonder metaphorically if the spirits of those people who lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau still lingered. And then this thought just hit me. I needed to photograph their ghosts. And so I did. By using the other guests at the camp and using a long exposure, I had them stand in proxy for those who had lived and died. Two of the challenges of photographing here, one, as I set my tripod up, the people would move out of the way, not wanting to ruin my photograph. They didn't understand. I needed them in the photograph. And so I had to quickly devise a technique. I would turn my back to the camera. I would play the part of the loud American and speak very loudly into my cell phone. And using a remote shutter release, I would take the shot once they had moved back into the scene. I literally 
had less than 45 minutes at Auschwitz and an hour at Birkenau. So I was running from location to location, trying to get in as many images before the tour left. This is the only image that I used that contained a living person. And I had my own thoughts about what that meant. But I've heard over a dozen other interpretations of what this image means. And then finally, the spirits escaping from the gas chamber. I could not bring myself to go in, nor could I ever go back. One of the great blessings this portfolio has been in my life is that I've been able to exhibit it at many Holocaust museums and there met many survivors because there are very few of them left like our World War II veterans, very few. I was exhibiting at the Dallas Holocaust Museum and I saw this woman being pushed around in a wheelchair and she was leaning forward, looking very closely at each image. So I went up and introduced myself. I said, hi, my name is Cole and these are my images. And then she raised this crooked bony finger that was shaking and she pointed at the images and said, these are my images. Edith Molnar had been interned at Auschwitz-Birkenau and had survived. And I couldn't fathom what it must be like to see those images there. I also was privileged to speak at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and there addressed over a hundred survivors shook their hands, listened to their stories, and it was simply amazing. Talk about a shiver going down your spine. Final tip. What's the easiest way to make money from fine art photography? Sell your equipment. Very few of us will ever get rich from our photography, but that's not why we do it. We do it because we need to say something. We need to express ourselves, and I'm not good with expressing my feelings and emotions but I can do things with a camera that I can't do with words. Summary, three-legged dogs are awesome and so is black and white. The real key is your vision. Forget the rules. Don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. Learn to let go of those vision blockers because everyone does have a vision and listen to the music. Thank you. I'm going to stop my share and bring my camera. Now, someone tell me I didn't, I wasn't uh, muted the entire time and you didn't hear anything. Sure. Yeah, you'll have to come back. We couldn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought that was fantastic call. Um, I, I loved your images for the several years that uh, I've seen your work and I, um, I bought a few of your images, which hang over in my wall right over here. And uh, yes, the um, the angel Gabriel is, is a fantastic image, and uh, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't do well on our on our uh, exhibition nights. For <laughs> but I, I don't really care. It, it's it's a wonderful image. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Comments, you, questions, please. Ken, I see you got a hand up. Oh, hi, Cole. Uh, thank you so much. That was just amazing. I loved it. Um, I really appreciated your comment about, you know, your vision being, uh, you know, the sum of your experiences. And I was struck by your love of low-key dark images. And I wonder if you would verbalize or, or care to verbalize, what is it about you that makes you like those images, you know, dark, low-key images? Because, I mean, so many people just go the other way. They go like high-key. You know, I don't know if I know the answer. Somebody once said, do I have a dark outlook on life? And I said, no. And I hope my image don't convey a dark outlook on life. I just remember, you know, this will sound so silly and I don't even know if this is true, but I remember when I was, I don't know if this it was about 10, 11, 12 years old when I saw Ed Sullivan and I saw the Beatles. And I, like everyone else, went crazy and I started wearing black. I would wear black pants, black shirt, black. I even bought beetle boots. And I just, I think I fell in love with black. And a funny side note, my younger brother, five years younger, he was in kindergarten and he uh, had this school psychologist contact my mother and say, we need to have a conference. And my mom goes in and she goes, yeah, there's something wrong with Kip. 
he's 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 upset about something because he colors in black. And my mother said, no, it's because his brother loves black and I won't let him wear black. But I just fell in love with black. And I don't know if that's why. But, you know, when I was talking about as a 14 year old boy, those were the images I always loved, those dark ones. So I don't know why. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Usually somebody wants to take a poke at me over photographic celibacy. David, did you raise your hand? I did. Um, Cole, thank you. Great presentation. Very inspiring. I uh, have a question about um, visualizing an image. When you do so, are you thinking about the print as the final image or what you see on the screen? Because as you pointed out, and we all know, they're very different. Um, are you? I assume you're thinking about the print primarily when you're envisioning the image. Is that correct? Yes. And it's been interesting because the last few days I've had this discussion with several people. Is the print going away because of a younger generation raised on mm -hmm. screens? Uh, I hope not because anyone who has seen one of my prints are kind of surprised because they've only seen an electronic version. Um, so I hope they don't go away. So the second question is, what are your favorite papers for printing black and white? 95% uh, of my work is on Hannah Mule Photo Rag 308. Mm -hmm. The other 5% is on uh, uh, Epson Exhibition Fiber. Yes. Uh, Zoltan, is that uh, image I've, the Angel Gabriel, is that on a glossy or a matte paper? Uh, that's glossy. Okay, so that would be the Exhibition Fiber. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your time. I do want to give away a copy of the Angel Gabriel, my most significant image. And how we do that is uh, we do it on the birthday system. Who's got a birthday today? Don't worry, I've never had somebody with a birthday today. Who's had a birthday a couple of days before today or a couple of days after today? A week on either side of today. Anybody even close to today? You got to you got to unmute if you got the answer. Don't be saying it with your mute oh. on. <laughs> Mary, what do you got? Twenty-five of what? March. March twenty-fifth. Oh, that's pretty doggone close. What is today? The sixteenth. Yep. That's six days away, Mary. Right? No, today's the sixteenth. Uh, nine oh. days away. Nine. I can't even do math. Can anybody beat that? Can anybody beat Mary and steal the angel Gabriel from her? Today's my anniversary. Does that count? <laughs> well, it's the anniversary of your birth, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, it sounds like you're the winner. Would you send me an email with your mailing address and I'll get that off to you? I will do that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Cole. Thank you. Thank you all for your yeah. time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you for being wow. invited. Well, I, I just I, I wanted to add that um, if if I've been telling everybody when I've reminded them to go take a look on your website, but it's worth some time because uh, um, some of the images there there you have stories about how you've put them together, um, blogs with fantastic uh, um, content on it. So I would advise anybody that enjoyed this presentation and hasn't been to the website take a look. It's really it's really inspiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank Cole, you this was fabulous. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and Zoltan, thank you again for bringing him into my world and all of our worlds now. Absolutely. So. Yeah, and, and don't forget to sign up for Cole's uh, newsletter. Newsletter, because you can win a print. I know, because I won one. <laughs> <laughs> and I only do about four or five a year, so you won't be inundated. Cole, can I, uh, can I squeeze in one more question? You bet. I appreciate that. I, I liked uh, I liked everything you said about you know not not giving a damn about what other people think about your photography, but you did spend I thought you said many many years caring about what other people thought, and when you go back to your chart there of your blender, don't you think that some of that time that you spent caring about what other people thought and and changing your photography 
influenced your vision in the end? Absolutely. Everything I've experienced did. So all of those negative experiences of trying to please others just reinforced. And I, I suspect it's partly age too. You know, you get to a certain point and you say, why am I trying to please others? Because uh, I tell people criticism stings and can be discouraging, but praise is really dangerous. It can be harmful because it turns <laughs> my head. You know, oh, I love your work. Oh, I love that image. Uh, that's more dangerous. I try to stay in tune with what I think, what I feel, what I believe. Is my past a part of that? Sure. Yeah, some of some of that time that you spent that may seem like it was wasted was actually actually may have been helping you quite a bit. You know, that's hard lessons. I'm, I'm see. I like I like to think maybe I'm still in that phase where I'm trying to copy other people, and yeah. someday I'll get to your point where I. I'm sure, more sure of my own vision. <laughs> well, I hope I've planted some seeds, uh, some thoughts about vision. Thank you. Okay, all. Yeah. I guess I'll say good night to you if nothing Night else. carefully. Okay, you all take care. Night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Cole. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Yeah.